Good evening and welcome to ISW Council's special web show, Step Up, Understand Your Asthma. ISW Council is dedicated towards increasing awareness about one's health and well-being. And today we're talking about asthma, but the number of patients is increasing because of lifestyle issues like air pollution. This show is supported by AstraZeneca. Now, among India's 1.3 billion people, about 6% of children and 2% of adults have asthma. Asthma is a chronic lung disease that has a long-lasting effect on an individual. It causes difficulty in breathing due to the narrowing of the airways in the body. It is believed to be an immune response to an allergen entering the body. 90% of childhood asthma and 50% of adult asthma is caused due to environmental allergens. Now, globally, the economic cost associated with asthma exceeds that of TB and HIV AIDS combined together. It is considered among the most common chronic disease among children. So how can you manage asthma? When should you seek treatment? What are the treatment options that are available for asthma patients? Could asthma patients have severe respiratory distress? Should they contract COVID? To discuss all this and more about asthma, please welcome Dr. Deepak Palwar, Chairman, Metro Center for Respiratory Diseases and, Mul and Metro Multi Speciality Hospital, NOIDA. Welcome to the show, Dr. Palwar. Thank you, Anisha. Now, with an extensive experience of 30 years, Dr. Palwar is amongst the most trustworthy and recognized doctors in East Palmanal in India. He has established the Metro Center for Respiratory Diseases in the year 1999 which is the advanced respiratory setup in India. Dr. Talwar has a lot of experience in having all types of uh, complicated respiratory ailments along with other chest-related procedures with a very high success, success rate. We're very, very privileged to have you with us, uh, Dr. Talwar. But, and we're going to talk about a very important issue of asthma. I just want to understand from you, who is prone to getting asthma? Uh, can you prevent it? Right. So I think it's a very relevant question, you know, that uh, why one member of the family has and the other members don't have, because when we discuss with them, so there has to be a genetic predisposition to develop it. Your airways are very sensitive. So the moment they get exposed to some environmental stimuli, which can be in the form of allergens, it can be non-specific, uh, non-allergic stimuli like irritants, it can be dust particles, it can be viral infections, so many of them, whatever goes and stimulates the, you know, the, the passages in the airways, our airway passages, uh, they will lead to sudden spasm. So the airways will become narrowed. The air will getting in will be like going through the small windpipes. The patient will not be able to breathe well. And this, because this, uh, uh, there's, uh, there, there's a stimulation of cough. So they start having cough, breathlessness and wheezing. So these are the three symptoms they will produce, but they have to have the right combination of the airways being born with susceptibility to respond whenever there is a there is a you know the stimuli there what we call as triggers are there but these triggers are also there in other people who are, are surrounding that one person who suffers it so that's why you know the question comes that perhaps that why do i have it so you have it because it is in the genes and the ge genetic penetration is not where you can clearly say that if my father and a mother have asthma, I will also have it. No, it's not necessary. Even if your father and mother don't have it, you can still have it because the lineage which follows in hereditary is not very clearly going down the line where we look forward to like, you know, one member suffering, the other one will have, although the chances will be more definitely, but it doesn't give a guarantee that if your parents have asthmatic or your one of the parent has asthmatic or grandparents had asthmatic, yes, you are, have got tendency to have more chances, but that doesn't mean it will translate into development of asthma in all. Dr. Talwar, what role does air pollution have to play in asthma? Because uh, I'm asthmatic and uh, I was in class 10 so when my father took me to the doctor and my father said her mother has asthma but the doctor said it's pollution sir it is so polluted sir. Uh, this is what is bringing it on what role does pollution have pain asthma 
I think this is again a very good question and uh, we have been always debating about how much the air pollution plays a role. It definitely does play a role because we know we have particulate metals in them and we have gases in them and we know all these gases, they can go and stimulate your lungs and can lead to development of symptoms. I think the correlation is being primarily because whenever the air pollutions are high, you find that more patients are suffering, they report, even those patients who were going on stable, the moment the air pollution level goes to 400, 500, they start having a wheezy chest and they develop symptoms and they report to the doctors, hospitalizations as well as emergency room visits increases. And I think the, the other way around to see that whether if the air pollution goes down, you feel better. I think the best data can come from the last year's lockdown, which extended three months. And in, during those three to five months, whatever was the lockdown period, our patients said that they are feeling a lot better, actually. They are able to breathe much better. And their, uh, you know, the exacerbations which used to come during this April month because of the pollens and other things, they decreased. Although the pollens never decreased, but only the pollution decreased. So I think there is a direct as well as an indirect link which tells us that the disease becomes worse with increasing air pollution. And there are multiple gases and other things which are present. And of course, uh, you know that if you decrease the pollution levels, then you obviously feel better. But there are countries where there is no pollution and still asthma yeah. exists. And in yeah. a country like New Zealand, where you have almost 25% people, people suffering from asthma, it's very clean, actually. So still yeah. you will get it. But only thing is that in, in, in developing world, it definitely is one of the trigger which leads to worsenings in our group of people more common. Right. So... Um what triggers asthma is something perhaps many people cannot control. So how do they make themselves feel better? What are the controllers and the relievers of uh, asthma? So asthma is a disease which cannot be cured. You know, I will say that in upfront. But many of these patients, they will become mild intermittent asthma where they may not require treatment for many years or sometimes once a year or sometimes 10 years. And they feel as if the asthma is gone. It's not gone, but it has definitely become much better in control. And you perhaps are able to live without your medicines for a long time. But by and large, you need medications. And the important thing is the medicines which are available now, they are completely safe. They can be used on long term. They are very quick and very, very uh, effective. So these are the inhalers medications because the medicines have to reach the airways. And the best way is giving it directly through the inhalers rather than giving it through the tablets and the syrups. And we find that these inhalers are very, very effective in controlling your symptoms, making you as good as you don't have any disease at all. So we use two types of inhalers here. One are called preventive medicines and one are called relievers. So reliever is like you develop symptoms and you use it. So it is like, you know, I have, and this is very commonly seen across that the moment you have a trouble, you use the inhaler and it's called a blue inhaler because it's a, it's a blue colored. Everybody knows it comes by the names of salbutamol inhaler or turbutaline inhalers, uh, various companies make it. But what it does is immediate bronchodilation. Your airways are constricted. You take this inhaler, the airways get dilated and you feel better. But the asthma is not only this uh, spasm of airways, it is also inflammation. So in, as you very rightly put the word, chronic respiratory disease. So if it's a chronic respiratory disease, there is a chronic inflammation going on. And for that, what we need is a inhaled corticosteroids. So we use inhaled corticosteroid in combination with bronchodilator for long-term maintenance. And that is a preventer therapy so that you don't develop symptoms. In fact, asthma patient is entitled to live a life where they don't have any symptoms at all. They should live as normally as possible. So if you have any disease like hypertension or diabetes, you take one tablet or whatever is the medicine and you remain healthy, you are always happy about it. Same way if you have to take inhaler once a day and you are like 24 into 7 good, then that's fine because still it is not going into blood. It is not going through your stomach. It is not upsetting your systems. It is delivered directly to the lungs. So absolutely safe and combination ICS. In fact, it is the steroid, which everybody knows about it post COVID that steroids are used. But only thing is these are the inhaled steroids and inhaled steroid is in microgram dose. So people have taken like 40 milligram of prednisolone, 40 milligram of prednisolone will be equivalent to perhaps 10 to 20 inhalers. So which you will use perhaps in years. So what you took in one day, 
it is going to be spread over years so not to be scared about the side effects but people do worry that uh, you know i get addicted mera to kaam hi nahi chalega agar main puff pee lunga is this true So, I think uh, this is this is not about addiction this is about what your body needs it so if if needs it you need to use it actually you know you know a lot of people have got cataracts and they get used to seeing whatever they are able to see and they are happy about it once they will get the surgery done and they will use the spectacles they will say oh i got dependent on it but then you wanted a better life you can't live with whatever is this you know compromising life is something which is like very very important in fact the surveys show from india that we are a lot more uh, tolerant population where we would like to live with the symptoms with a poor quality of life rather than take a medicine and become normal because of our own myths and other things which are always there in our mind so i think that's the very important message that if this disease is so well and we are telling you it is safe it is safe it is safe people have and children can use anybody can use for years together without getting any serious side effects at all any significant side effects at all so then i don't think so there is any need to get worry about addiction about long term safety because they have been used for almost 40 50 years now and they have been shown to be remarkably safe remarkably safe i would use the word right now you told us there are two different types of inhalers but do i need to take inhalers if i'm feeling okay it is absolutely okay and now in the newer gina guidelines what we are getting is that you know you don't need to have two types of inhaler only one type of inhaler will be good, doing good like one time you use it for maintenance and then for sos if you have symptoms you can use the same one so now the life has become like one inhaler for all purpose so it makes the things much easier from the patient's perspective that they don't have to carry two different type of inhalers and get confused that which one is to be used at what mm-hmm. time and that used to be very common couple of years ago uh, the patient will forget that what was the preventer and what was the reliever and they will mix them up and then start always be come back to you after maybe one year or two years that they are only taking reliever medications they have forgotten about the preventer medication but now because the they, we have one inhaler which fits into both the scenarios so their life has become not only easy but easy for the patients also to understand what to use when okay Could you tell us what is this dual dual inhaler? A little more about this because even I am not very aware about. It. So this is uh, you know that uh, that kind of inhaler which will have two medicines in it. One is a bronchodilator which will give you immediate relief, and it will also have an inhaled corticosteroid because you get symptoms because the inflammation is also more. So you suppress that inflammation with the dose of ICS which is added to it, and that is the same inhaler ICS lava in combination. which is used on uh, preventer medication also so only thing is that the drug which immediately gets you the relief so it contains formitrol and it contains a inhaled co- steroid component which is either buricinide or fluticasone or one of them and uh, the idea is that whenever the symptoms come it is not only the 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 airways which have become narrowed but also because of the inflammation inside so when you take the medicine both of them will be okay and that is what is required for the preventer also so preventer and reliever coming together is this new kind of uh, you know what is called as a smart approach so it it, it mm-hmm. makes the life easy all right dr sarmar uh, is it when it comes to the treatment of asthma with inhalers one size fits all because some some people say you know my asthma doesn't uh, respond very well to this kind of inhaler but uh, my cousin is doing taking the same inhaler is fine i am not fine i still feel uh, uncomfortable breathless uh, i mean will similar uh, medications have the same effect in two different ways so i think this is this is a very important aspect anisha you have brought is like we see the family so four five people coming together surprisingly the mother who is like 65 years has rarely need to use the inhaler and a younger boy who comes is not only using it but still not getting effective because his lung functions are very poor so this tells us you know that the asthma is of not same severity across the board in entire population of people so some people have got more severe asthma and others have got a more easily manageable mild to moderate asthma so by and large 90 to 95% of asthmatics will respond to these inhalers and if they do not respond what it indicates to us is that the disease has been long standing neglected 
not properly treated where this kind of inflammation which is going on in the airways make them smaller and smaller in size and less responsive to the inhalers in fact less response to these inhalers means that the disease is little more progressed and perhaps was not treated at an earlier stage and as we all know that we have been given two lungs like two kidneys you know even if you remove one you can live normally so people don't realize that they have symptoms because they think that they are doing okay why do you need to ask me to use it that is true you are okay but if your lung functions are at 60% would you like them to be leaving at there or you want it 80 90% like normal people so people are in the habit of you know chasing the blood pressure values blood sugar values every bit by bit but lung functions because they are little difficult to perform they are not done routinely every day so they do not know they go by their own perception and their perception is i'm doing well so you may be doing well your lung functions are just 40% and your age is 40 years would you like to live with that no so unless and until you test for those things you will not be able to know that and that's i think uh, people have to understand that there are certain numbers which you need to chase in asthma also okay um dr talwar other than inhalers when and why are oral corticosteroids kept in asthma patients and do they have a long term safety so anisha 40 years ago when i started looking at asthma patients at that point of time the only option was oral corticosteroids so those who do not respond they will get steroids and they will feel so better that even if you want to stop them they are not ready to stop and if they stop they will start on their own because they know that this is the treatment which they will take but long term corticosteroids have got even of a small dose or even if you use four five times in a year have a serious long term side effects like osteoporosis your bones mm-hmm. become weak you develop cataracts your skin becomes very thin and fragile you keep bleeding into the skin and of course you have a hypertension diabetes and all this Uh, you know the the the, the complications uh, which are associated with oral corticosteroids at that time you know we used to use the drugs like azathioprine and cyclophosphamide the anti cancer drugs so that the, we can take the steroid portion out but obviously these were not good options neither even gold was used i i remember i have used it in 1980s so that used to be used as, as a sparing agent so that we don't want steroids we knew for years we know that steroids have side effects and we cannot give it on a long term basis or recurrently required to control the patient but now in the last 10 years we have got what is called as targeted therapy and this means that whatever is troubling you and driving your disease is being targeted by biologics and they work like steroids but they are not steroids they are injectable forms sometimes given once a month sometimes twice a month sometimes once in two months depending upon which type of biologics are available but these has come as a rescue now for all patients who do not get well with their routine inhalers so if they continue to suffer on that then we actually you know personalize their therapy according to their markers so we do certain test we look at their blood eosinophils we do their test like serum ige allergy tests and things like that and decide on to which biologics to be given to them and they do remarkably wonderful without steroids so steroids have now been pushed as the last therapy of course there is an important thing that uh, steroids are very very inexpensive they cost hardly any penny for that so most of the people in the villages and in the cities would like to self medicate themselves with steroids till the time they realize how harmful they are so we see them at that stage but still we will be able to salvage them by switching on to the alternative therapies which are available now because the asthma medication has totally revolutionized in last a decade right we have this, now new this things this targeted therapy that you're talking about dr silvar who who gets this who who's the most suitable candidate okay so these are the group of patients who are already on maximized inhaled therapy so we have three types of drugs to be given that is inhaled corticosteroid which i discussed then bronchodilators and there are two types of bronchodilators one are beta 2 agonist and one are anticholinergic so these people are on all three drugs which are used to treat asthma and still continue to have symptoms they continue to require oral steroids to you know take care of their worsenings which happen and they continue to get worse and get into the hospital and get 
you know, admitted in the hospital and take treatment for four, five days and then go back home. So these are the group of people who are really suffering from asthma despite their treatment. And as you have said in the beginning itself, that these are the people who will say, you know, my inhalers don't work so well as my other members mm -hmm. does. So in this particular group of people, we phenotype them. Phenotyping is like what will suit you most mm -hmm. and then give you that. So that's the precision medicine in asthma, which we practice these days. So uh, you, you said about, you know, hospitalization. Uh, my mother was also hospitalized uh, because of asthma. And like you said, she, self, she kept self-medicating uh, herself till, you know, everything was body. Now, what is severe asthma? So severe asthma is, uh, you know, it's, it's like the top of the ladder of asthma suffering, where you are at the point where despite taking your medications regularly, and, you know, self-medication, generally what we do is we tell them that if you work, get worse, you have to start this. But then you also need to report to the doctor. Why did it happen? Can we do anything better in that or not? So when they keep getting these attacks of asthma despite their therapy, which is with the routine inhalers which you are using, that means that now you are at that point where if your asthma is so severe that it can not only lead to poor quality of life, but it also produces a life-threatening situations like getting hospitalized in the in intensive care unit for taking mm -hmm. care where it takes longer time. So these are the situations which we call it as a severe asthma. And these patients, once they are stabilized, they are the ones whom we want that this kind of scenarios or this kind of uh, situation should never arise again. So, uh, um, you know, how is it different from mild to moderate asthma? How can you tell? See, with my mother... She, she had a long history of asthma, so she's like, I will, I will take my inhaler, I will take my nebulizer, I'll get better. She kept doing it, she didn't get better. And uh, my dad had to physically pick her up and take her to the hospital. And the, the doctor was like, why should you come so late? She's in such a bad state. Uh, another incident was where a cousin's uh, uh, relative was so happily dancing at a wedding that suddenly she had a massive medical and she collapsed. She just fainted and she had to be rushed to the hospital. So uh, that is sudden. But how do we tell that this is the asthma that I manage with my inhalers or corticosteroids or whatever, and this is very severe, this needs some other kind of intervention? So, you know, we, we talk about this uh, sudden collapse, and we see it a lot many times in the, in the movies also, that it happens mm. all of a sudden. And they are showing at that point of time the same overdosage and overusage of blue inhaler, actually. So if you mm. are using it repeatedly, then the airways will become very rigid and stop responding to it. And the, on the top of it, because of your own, uh, you know, uh, the system which accepts or is able to perform, you try to overstretch that and use the activities. And then at certain point you realize, oh, it's not possible and you collapse something mm -hmm. like that. So this is like, uh, you know, uncontrolled asthma. We call it uncontrolled asthma. So, you know, if you are awakening in the night with the symptoms of cough, uh, difficulty in breathing or some wheezing or during the day, time you develop it almost like twice or thrice a week they are the symptoms which are trying to tell us that your asthma is not under control and you can develop a sudden worsening with severe asthma and get into acute attack where you can you need to be taken to the hospital and at that point of time because there is so much of inflammation that even if you use the inhalers and nebulizer it will take time and you need to be given systemic steroids to take control of it so that's an acute asthma attack but it can occur mostly in people who have got uncontrolled asthma for a long time. But it can also occur all of a sudden if you get exposed to something to which you are strongly allergic. Like it's very commonly reported in people who have got peanut allergy. So suddenly everything is fine. Somebody starts eating peanuts, they smell it and they develop the acute attack like that. So it does happen in people who have got allergy to fish, allergy to prawns, allergy to strawberries, or allergy to nuts. So those kind of things are like sudden onset only. They will come unannounced in a normal person. Or if you may develop some with a drug or some injection, you can develop that also. So these are, these are or it, uh, yeah, very importantly, it can also happen with ingestion of aspirin or a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug mm -hmm. like brufen, combifloam or wuvron. Mm -hmm. They can suddenly push you into a severe attack because of the sensitivity to these drugs. So these are the things which can happen in normal people, 
but mostly sudden worsenings happen in uh, uh, are not so sudden but they have been not getting noticed and the people have been trying to carry on with their activities with the you know use of inhalers or over use of inhalers i would mm-hmm. say and uh, suddenly they find that the asthma which was uncontrolled has suddenly become very severe or severe right so uh, uh, dr lal you know uh, there seems to be some confusion about uh, the steroid and the uh, the oral steroid and the inhaled steroid after all the steroid how is it that the inhaled one is much safer than the oral one so it's a very simple thing uh, anisha if somebody has got a skin lesion he gets an ointment in which there is a already steroid they will put it never ask the doctor what is there mm. right so if you have got any any allergy in your eyes your doctor gives eye drops which contain steroids you keep putting it and you are never asking the doctor what is happening mm. but when it is given in the inhaled form because everybody can read that these are steroids they immediately get steroid uh, mm. phobia so what I, i what i would emphasize is that if you require even once in a year you know two days of symptoms which require oral prednisolone or oral methylprednisolone or whatever is the deflazacort whichever make it is there you use it even for a two days as i said that it is good enough for almost three years of inhaled therapy and you can imagine taking it in two days versus three years obviously your body exposure has shown that it's of no side effects at all so i think that phobia has to go from the mind that inhaled corticosteroids are same as oral corticosteroids they are not that not even drop in the ocean they are that small dose it's a very very microgram dose in fact i tell people to read what is given here so they'll see that they'll read and tell me it is 100 micrograms or 200 micrograms i said you will require this much to make it into 1 gram actually so why are you so much worried about about so i think that phobia has to come out because it is in our inbuilt system and slowly it is improving but i am sure that uh, this is a very big challenge for the pediatricians who are looking after children where it has been uh, you know the parents are very very anxious but important mm-hmm. point is that over the years chronic use of inhaled corticosteroids to control asthma even in children has not been shown to have any side effect like stunting growth or side okay. effects of steroids so it has been proven beyond doubt for that also okay so uh, you are saying that there are no developmental challenges for of children taking it inhalers but you know there is also a belief ki uh, you know bachpan mein jo asthma hota hai wo bade hote chale jata hai you know you right. know a childhood asthma Right. Who is this? And what right. role do inhalers play? Yeah, so a lot of parents, you know, they keep praying to God that by the time our child will become 13 year old, he will grow out of asthma. Mm-hmm. So 30 percent of uh, children who have asthma will actually remit asthma completely and will have no symptoms. 30 percent will continue to have symptoms as they had during their childhood, and 30 percent of them will become worse. Now, the most common question from the pa- parent side is. will my child belong to a which improves b which doesn't improve or c which deteriorates so the only answer on the basis of various clinical studies is that if your asthma during childhood is well taken care of if you become controlled asthmatic your chances of becoming out of asthma or getting stable asthma are very high but if you continue to suffer your asthma your asthma is not controlled in childhood you will definitely have a severe asthma in adulthood also it will not go away So the, what I think is the, the best way? Is, yeah, but we tell us what is the best way to control uh, asthma in childhood because in so childhood asthma, you want a good life. I sorry, I didn't get the question. No, how? What is the best way to control childhood asthma? Because as you grow, you want to have a good life. Absolutely. So the the message for the, to the parents is very clear. We give them that your asthma asthmatic child needs control with the inhaled medication, and inhalers have to be given. The dose of inhalers will be monitored very closely. We will try to bring it down to the lowest possible requirement of your child. You need to do the monitoring at home, which we call it peak expiratory flow rates. And they sooner or later they learn how to increase or decrease the dose, so that we they keep the dose to minimum to allay their fears as well as keep the asthma under control. So same therapy what we give in adults, we give it to children in a smaller dosages because they are smaller in size. and of course they are they are they are monitored more frequently as compared to adults for up titrating or down titrating the dosages and for that we do the home monitoring before which as i already said we use peak expiratory flow rates right uh, dr talwar we're coming to the close of the show so i'm we spoke a lot about treatment 
I want to understand about some lifestyle changes. My cousin would have severe asthma every April because of the pollen. She would leave Delhi, she'd go to Bangalore, Mumbai, wherever she'd be fine. So, uh, what lifestyle changes can you make? She could afford to do it. A lot of people yeah. can do that. And does exercise play any role, especially yoga? Right. So, I think one important aspect is, you know, the anxiety. The, 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 the anxiety and, and the behavior modification which is required. So, if I suddenly develop anxiety, now I can actually throw an asthma attack and nobody will be able to find out whether it is because of anxiety only. So, anxiety plays a very important role. You need to understand that lifestyle modifications has to make very important aspect into asthma med- management because medication is only a part of it. Rest all is, you know, good lifestyle. style practice is required no hurry bari and good diet good exercises yoga people are practicing but what actually yoga helps is a meditation so it helps your brain to cool down because the brain releases so many hormones which goes and constrict the airways and produce the symptoms which are like asthma only and you cannot distinguish whether this asthma has come from here or it has come from the inhalation so it's difficult so lifestyle modification with the lots of things which you need to change even in the diet you know if you have lot of gastroesophageal reflux coming because of carbonated drinks spicy food oily food or late food in the night all these things also make things worse you need to change everything all right uh, dr salwar thank you so much for joining us today it's been very enlightening to hear you uh, about asthma and asthmatic myself. I thought I knew a lot, but I really learned a lot about the, the uh, newest techniques to treat asthma and how important it is to stay on the course for your treatment, to not uh, say that I'm now fine, so let me not take it. Uh, don't wait for the worst time to come. Thank you so much, Dr. Talwar, for joining us and uh, sharing with us the wealth of your knowledge. I'm sure all uh, those who are listening would be uh, better informed about asthma and treatment options and how they can make their lives as close to normal as possible, even though this is a chronic disease. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nishan.